Afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for being patient. So this is our monthly briefing. I'm happy to have you all here. Happy to have Deputy Mayor Owens here, as usual, as well as Chief Buckner. And let's just go through the agenda briefly. So we'll, we'll give an update on COVID-19. We will. Uh, I'm going to talk about the visit that I just had at Van Dyne. We'll go over uh, crime data. Chief will have some information to share on public safety. Uh, give everyone an update on uh, the city's response to the uh, 81 draft environmental impact statement, which is going in today. And uh, then a couple, a couple of fun things are. Uh, Asphalt Art Award, uh, are we covering that? I don't think we're going to cover that one. Uh, but our natural play space and uh, big football game coming up on Friday. All right, so starting with COVID, um, just looking at the numbers here, we've got uh, currently, or as of October 12, 450 cases. Um, that is uh, that is up from 365 one month ago. Um, so that's a 23% rate of increase. Last month, we reported that the cases had tripled uh, between August and September. So by that standard, things have slowed down, but, but certainly not the uh, direction that we want. So we're still, still really concerned, um, seeing some evidence maybe of some flattening out, but, um, um, but we're not, certainly not letting our guard down and just want to remind everyone that the best weapon we have is vaccination. On that note, an update on city vaccination numbers. So right now, 62.1% of the city population 18 and above has at least one dose. Um, when you take the entire population, we're at 51% uh, of the city with at least one dose, 45.1% of the city fully vaccinated. Of course, that includes uh, a significant amount of the population that is not yet eligible for the vaccination. Um, so we are waiting with bated breath for the CDC to weigh in on uh, vaccinations uh, for uh, at least Pfizer vaccination for children ages 5 to 11. That's that's really going to be our next opportunity to see a big jump in that number and it uh, can't come soon enough. Um, we talked every month, uh, really every day, about the importance of getting vaccinated. So I'm just going to offer some additional perspective and hopefully incentive uh, to folks that for whatever reason are not getting vaccinated. Um, number one, we all know how much our hospitals are being strained right now. Uh, it is affecting healthcare delivery. So uh, if you are sick, if a loved one is sick uh, and need hospital care, um, we are at risk uh, in, in getting the care that everyone needs because uh, we have too many people getting sick from a preventable situation by not getting the vaccine. Secondarily, we need to keep our, keep our kids in the classroom. Uh, we're seeing other school districts that have had to go to remote uh, and um, Luckily, to this point, we've been able to keep our kids in the city school district in our classrooms. That's where we want to keep them. And again, parents, family members, if you get vaccinated, there's a better chance that we're going to be able to keep our kids in school where we know they need to be and where they learn best. The vaccine is proven safe. It's working. If you have remaining questions at this point, get them answered by a healthcare provider. But at this point, there's really no, no more excuses. Uh, we need to see more people getting vaccinated. As a reminder, the county has a weekly vaccination clinic at the Civic Center. It takes place on Tuesday mornings and afternoons, in the morning from 9 to 11.30, in the afternoon from 1 to 3 p.m. We also heard the county announce yesterday that they are opening a new uh, symptomatic testing center at the Old Heritage Lincoln uh, auto dealer at 800 West Genesee Street. And that uh, testing center will operate Monday through Friday, 9 to noon, uh, beginning on Friday, October 5th, uh, 15th. So uh, appreciate the county's efforts in uh, building our testing capacity to make sure that, uh, again, we're, we're identifying where the virus is and isolating it as quickly as possible. So moving on to, uh, to city employees, city staff. So as a reminder, uh, the city of Syracuse is the only local municipality with a vaccine or test requirement, and because of that, you know, we've had uh, to um, we've had to, to learn a lot and, and work quickly to get that program up and running. And we're making progress. We're not uh, all the way there yet. So as of today, 
Uh, we have 56% of our employees that have uh, provided proof of vaccination. I want to be clear, that doesn't mean that only 56% of city employees are vaccinated. That number is high. Uh, we're doing our best to be transparent and sharing the data as it becomes available, but it is incomplete data. So I want to be crystal clear on that. Um, so why, uh, what, what else uh, remains out of that um, for, uh, out of that 44%? Um, so two things. One, either they're they're uh, they're not vaccinated, um, or two, they have not yet uh, participated in our program. They haven't uploaded uh, their information yet. Um, so you know that 56% is pretty consistent across departments, but again, is a is an incomplete sample. Uh, so right now, we're really moving uh, to uh, the point where um, we need to get uh, a full and comprehensive. Uh, snapshot of, of vaccinations. We need to understand why those that have yet to upload their information in the system haven't done that. We know that there's been some technical challenges for those that may not be as technologically inclined to be able to download the app that we use. Um, and but we, you know, I suspect there are some that are uh, that are intentionally non-compliant. And once we identify those individuals, uh, we will begin progressive discipline. So that uh, that is where we are at right now. Though uh, department heads and supervisors have the list of those in their uh, in their departments that have not yet uh, uh, participated in the program. Uh, they are again troubleshooting, identifying where where people need help and, and where people uh, need discipline. Um, but uh, our expectation is by the end of this month uh, we will have a uh, a comprehensive snapshot of uh, of vaccinations across city government. And again, for those that uh, that are not complying or participating in our program, we will we will begin progressive discipline uh, beginning in November. I hope that won't be necessary. Again, overall, uh, I'm really proud of our workforce and, and them stepping up. Again, understanding that no one else is doing this around here, uh, and there is a learning curve for sure, both on the administration's end and on the employee's end. Uh, but it's it's critically important, and um, we're committed to fully implementing the policy and. Uh, and hopefully getting as many city employees vaccinated as possible. All right, let's move to um, ARPA investments. So our federal pandemic relief, we continue to make uh, good progress on getting those funds out of City Hall and into the hands of, of those that uh, that need, need it most. So, so far we've, uh, we've allocated in partnership with the Common Council around $44 million uh, out of our uh, ARPA funds. Again, overall we're gonna receive 123 million dollars of ARPA funds, we've received about half of that uh, up to this point, and of that, we've allocated 44 million. So today, uh, the Common Council is preparing for uh, their next meeting on October 25th, and is considering an additional 1.7 million dollars of ARPA investments. A lot of it is in parks, so uh, it includes uh, improvements to uh, Spirit of Jubilee Park, Kirk Park, uh, our city greenhouse, uh, Cannon Street Playground, as well as some parks on the north side. And uh, it also is going to police and digital infrastructure for police uh, purchasing an additional 60 body worn cameras um, to make sure that uh, all of our officers have uh, fully operational body worn cameras. And uh, digital infrastructure, um, we're investing 200,000 into our new city website, which again, uh, some may have noticed is it currently in beta phase uh, on our website, uh, but we hope to be able to fully up, uh, implement uh, with these funds. Um, so just for some perspective, I mentioned uh, we have uh, uh, we've committed about $44 million so far. So there was a, uh, a study uh, or an analysis conducted by the AP earlier this month that showed that uh, states had spent just about 2.5% of their initial allotment, while larger cities had spent about 8.5% of their allotment. And you compare that to Syracuse, where we've allocated about uh, just under 30% of ours. So uh, again, the purpose of these funds is to provide relief. Uh, so we feel a great sense of urgency uh, to, to push that money uh, out the door, uh, but to do it in a responsible way and put it where it's needed most and work closely with the Common Council. And I'm proud to say that uh, as, a, as a city, we are, uh, we are outperforming uh, most of our peers in that regard. All right, moving on to Van Dyne. I mentioned that I was up uh, at Van Dyne just before this briefing. Uh, I was up there with uh, Senator John Mannion and Senator Rachel May, uh, meeting with the leadership of Van Dyne and the company that owns Van Dyne 
uh, to tour the facility. Uh, I, uh, Van Dyne is located just outside of city limits, uh, but we certainly have a lot of city residents and city resident family members that, uh, that are at Van Dyne. Uh, I, going back to high school, I, I used to volunteer up there, so I know the facility well. Uh, I've had friends and family up there as well. And in the reports coming out of Van Dyne uh, recently during the pandemic, but as well as over the past few years, have been very, very concerned. Uh, and, and so the senators and I went up there today to reiterate what we had conveyed uh, in our respective letters to the leadership, uh, that we have grave concerns about the conditions there. Uh, what's, what has happened to uh, many of our neighbors living there is completely unacceptable. And while we are certainly sympathetic to the challenges that they have in the industry, namely staffing, uh, that it, there is no excuse uh, for the way that, uh, that uh, some people are living in that facility. And, uh, uh, and we are committed to working together and working with the state, uh, with the state health department, but also with the, with the ownership uh, to make sure that we improve the conditions there. Um, so again, I want to uh, acknowledge and thank the, the senators for their leadership. Uh, I want to thank the, uh, the owners for being willing to open the doors and, and, and bring us through. Um, they, uh, they, they acknowledge that there are um, real issues there and, and have um, reassured us that they are fully committed to addressing that. Um, but ultimately, until we see those conditions improve, we see the, uh, the, the state health department inspection reports improve, uh, we are going to continue to hold them accountable for, uh, for the conditions that, uh, that their residents are, are living in. So uh, the state health department, um, who we've been in touch with, uh, did recently conduct an inspection earlier this month. We're, we're, we're uh, looking forward to hearing from us soon. Uh, but I again want to reiterate that, like so many other of our problems, the problems at Van Dyne uh, are not new uh, to, uh, are, are specifically related to the pandemic. I first wrote a letter to Van Dyne after hearing concerns from constituents back in 2018. But like so many other problems, the pandemic has exacerbated uh, the challenges that they're facing up there. Uh, and again, while we're sympathetic uh, to them, and I, and I uh, listened intently as they went through the many challenges that they have, uh, we are all in full agreement that uh, there's no excuse uh, for allowing some of those conditions to, uh, to continue. And um, I remain, and, and I believe everyone remains fully committed to addressing them. All right, going to move into public safety. I'm going to turn it over to Chief in a minute, but before I do, just cover our weekly crime stat, uh, CompStat report. As a reminder, CompStat reports are uploaded on uh, SyracusePolice.org website every week. Uh, looking at the numbers, it's they've been fairly consistent uh, over the course of the second half of the year. Um, overall crime and property crime continue to be down. Uh, currently, overall Part 1 crime down 12% over last year, 15% over the five-year average. Uh, but we all know, uh, we are painfully aware uh, that the significant problem continues to be violent crime. Uh, you look at the violent crime number, we 4% over last year. Uh, homicides are at the same level they were last year, and last year was a, a horrific year and one that we never want to see repeated. So Chief Buckner and I are laser focused on addressing the issue of violent crime. Uh, we have many interventions uh, underway right now to address it, both from a law enforcement perspective uh, and a community perspective. Uh, and as it relates to the law enforcement perspective, again, I'm going to turn it over to the Chief to share some additional details. Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon. As, as the Mayor stated, uh, obviously the uh, Achilles heel that we've been dealing with as it relates to crime has been the violent crime. Uh, we continue to run our uh, give uh, initiatives, which is uh, a proactive approach to going into some of these hotspot areas, uh, being an intelligence-led police organization, uh, we try to be very, very efficient with the limited resources that we have, uh, and we continue to see some success with that. Uh, there were concerns, uh, obviously, when we were, had to temporarily remove our gun violence suppression uh, team, but the work that they were doing, uh, we continue to do those efforts uh, through some of the uh, grants that we have through give and also through our, our overtime funding. This also helps with the uh, minimum staffing, our special events, uh, and as I stated, the crime suppression details. One of the uh, key arrests that we made recently uh, involved uh, on, on uh, October the 9th, we, we continue to see uh, young men and in many cases juvenile uh, males uh, in possession of firearms. Uh, our, one of our SPO uh, camera operators uh, observed uh, a group of males hanging out in the front of 104 Davis Street 
uh, in possession of guns. Uh, the reason that we highlight this is because it, it, it's just reinforcing uh, as we continue to add to our camera footprint the value of these cameras uh, when we have these uh, retired officers that are in there monitoring them that we're making legitimate substantive uh, arrests as a result of those efforts. Uh, on that day in question, when the officers arrived on the scene after being directed to that uh, corner store that's located there, uh, there was one male, 18 years of age, that was arrested uh, with a Glock uh, 48. A 16-year-old male was arrested with a Glock 23. Uh, and another 16-year-old male was arrested with the, also with a Glock 23. All of this uh, occurring uh, on our corners, uh, out to, to where you know these folks can literally be seen uh, by the camera operators, which is tells you some of the brazen acts that these young men uh, are committing. Uh, another case on October the 11th, we had uh, SID individuals that were monitoring uh, the cameras. There were individuals in the 2600 block of Midland Avenue. Uh, two males uh, were observed to be in possession of firearms. Again, once we notified our units uh, to be able to get in the area to uh, engage these individuals, it led to a foot pursuit. Uh, as a result of, of that uh, a foot pursuit, there were two males that were arrested uh, 122 and the other one 33, both in possession of, of, of firearms, uh, and that investigation is still actively open. Uh, an update on body worn cameras, as the mayor said, as part of our ARPA uh, funds, we, we use that to expand upon that. Uh, we have 60 uh, additional cameras that we currently have now. Uh, 34 of those will be used for the current class. Uh, that is scheduled to graduate the second week of December. Uh, then we'll have roughly 25 or so uh, for an early start on our next class, which we expect to be somewhere in that neighborhood of 25 to 35 uh, candidates as well. So the good news is the, the officers in the class will hit the streets with their cameras, uh, and we already have many of the cameras that we'll need for our next class, which is scheduled to begin uh, late January, early February. Uh, that The first uh, call for that was actually today before the uh, Public Safety uh, Committee with uh, Chief Cecil. Shot spotter expansion. Another example of where technology is being a force multiplier for us. Uh, the north side of the city uh, didn't really have a footprint as it relates to shot spotters, primarily in our southwest section. Uh, we're adding an additional 2.14 square miles uh, to the north division. Uh, that gives us just over five uh, square miles for the entire city. It will certainly help us in those areas uh, where we're having challenges on the north side. Uh, and the mayor will also tell you that that's probably where some of the, the most uh, frustrating citizens that we have in our community engagement about some of the things that are going on in their community. Uh, so there's a, this is very uh, welcome news uh, from the citizens uh, in the north side of the community. Last week, we completed our cultural competency for law enforcement training. Uh, the gentleman that we contracted was out of Denver. Uh, he's did several, I, believe we were, I think we are the 14th police agency uh, that has had the training. Uh, what's unique about our training is uh, all sworn and non-sworn individuals of the police department completed the training. Uh, it is the first time that we've had our civilian workforce actually receive some of the training that the, the sworn got. That won't be the last time that we do that as we continue to try to improve of the training for our entire agency. Uh, we received very positive feedback uh, from all of the individuals, well not all, uh, for, for most of the individuals that uh, attended the training uh, received the value of it and, and actually learned something uh, and appreciated uh, you know, how the training was conducted and, and, and that was very positive uh, for us because that's a very sensitive subject for, for all parties involved uh, and the way our organization received that, I, I was proud of how they conducted themselves. Uh, lastly, we uh, uh, grants that we received uh, from our uh, first one from the uh, Department of Justice COPS CIT implementation grant uh, for $249,000. This will provide funding for police department to expand our use of crisis intervention teams. Uh, you know that that's part of our reimagined policing footprint, so this will certainly be a shot in the arm uh, for that, which will provide both mental and behavioral health services to individuals who are in crisis. Next, we have seven uh, iPads that will be given to these individuals that will be responding, which will give them an opportunity to be able to connect the individuals actually in crisis with, with services there uh, on site to kind of speed up that process. Uh, and then uh, lastly, on the, the uh, uh, awards, uh, offer funding of 250000 for Liberty Resources, uh, who you know is our primary partner with this alternative 
uh, response that, that we have. What's unique about this is it also has a component that allows us to triage those calls at the first point of contact, which is in the communications room. So we'll have individuals in there that will allow us to be able to uh, better sit, uh, respond with the appropriate people initially rather than going there and have, having to find out the additional information uh, later. So, so we're, we're taking up a, a part of that piece of, and I think that we're going to see a uh, good response from that. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, I always try to end on a good note with the, the business that I'm in. We, we have many good things going on. One of them that I'd like to highlight uh, is that the, the Deputy Mayor and Mayor will tell you that one of the complaints, that, not complaints, the biggest challenges that we get in requests is that they ask police to do more with our elementary and middle schools. Obviously, we have a significant footprint in our high schools, and we've seen the challenges that we're facing. Uh, Jimmy Oliver, who has hit the ground running and done an outstanding job with POW, uh, has created a, a winter basketball league that we will have. Uh, we have 200 kids that slots that we have available. 141 of those slots have been filled already. Uh, I will tell the, the folks who will, will, will see this, uh, this is for both boys and girls. Uh, 59 spots left. Uh, this is for grades 3rd through the 8th. Uh, our 3rd and 4th, 5th and 6th boys is already full. Cool. Uh, but we do have a waiting list. Uh, if you call for that or someone backs out, that you will still be able to get on that list. Uh, this is primarily our, our Syracuse uh, City uh, School District. Uh, practice begins on the first weekend of November. Our games actually start the first weekend of December uh, through February uh, the 19th. So we'll take them through the bulk of the winter to try to give these folks something to do. Uh, we're still in need of coaches, individuals who work concession stand, referees, and, and mentors. Uh, and if someone is interested in participating in that, we ask for them to reach out to uh, Mr. Oliver at uh, SYRPAL uh, at SyracusePolice.org. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. The report. So uh, I mentioned the 81 draft environmental impact statement. So today is the deadline for everyone to submit uh, their written responses to New York State for the DEIS. And as I mentioned, uh, we here at the City of Syracuse are preparing to submit ours. Uh, overall, the document is over 20 pages, includes 90 specific comments. Uh, and uh, those, those comments and recommendations came from uh, virtually every city department, engineering, DPW, water, parks, police, fire, law, assessment. Uh, it really was a team effort. I'm very proud of, of the work that our team put into this. I talked about this being a once in a generation opportunity and I really feel like our uh, our team felt that and, and put in the time uh, that, uh, that it deserved. So uh, we're putting the finishing touches on that and that will go in later this afternoon. Um, there's a lot in there. Uh, so I just want to cover a few um, few key themes. One, I'm just going to start where I started at the beginning of this project. I continue to believe and we in the city of Syracuse continue to believe that the community grid is the right option, not just for the city, but the entire region. But as I've also said, it doesn't mean it's the perfect option. So this was an opportunity to address some of the concerns within the existing plan, starting with the roundabout, which is proposed uh, adjacent to Dr. King's school. And uh, we included a very specific uh, comment in the in, in our in our response uh, that uh, that recommends relocating the roundabout uh, to a site south uh, of MLK and at least 600 feet from any school. We're also uh, pushing the state to take additional steps to address uh, noise and air impacts uh, for those that live in the immediate immediate vicinity. Um, we are asking the state to, to do more to mitigate the impacts on our city infrastructure as well as on public safety. Um, we are uh, encouraging them to, to pay close attention to the business loop 81 um, and, and to ensure we're not building an at-grade highway uh, through the city. Um, so looking at things like lane width as an example. Um, and uh, more than anything, uh, making sure that, um, that local community input, especially from those that live within the shadow of the viaduct in the immediate area, continues to be received. Um, and not, not just leading up to the project. When the project is taking place, after the project, there's going to be a lot of other important decisions, not the least of which is what to do with the land 
uh, that is freed up from this project. And those that live within that neighborhood uh, need to be at the table making the decisions about what happens with that land. And those decisions need to prioritize um, those very people. So that's something that we really hit home on in our comments. Um, another important element of the 81 project is workforce, creating opportunities for people in the city of Syracuse for, uh, for jobs and careers. Something the deputy mayor has worked really hard on and, uh, and has a, a brief update on where we are on the workforce front as really stating. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, we are have been working very hard since the beginning of the summer with an impressive group of folks. The DOT has brought together a sizable team of their staff, uh, along with myself, Greg Lowe. Um, and the Urban Jobs Task Force, who has just been um, leading the challenge on ensuring that this uh, transformational project includes people who live in the city of Syracuse, but particularly around that viaduct and have been impacted by it since it was erected. This team has been working for several months now on uh, what is called Set 14 application that will be submitted to the Federal, Federal Highway Administration. And what that will do is really put forth our um, application and our ask to the federal government to establish a local hiring um, provision on the project. What we've been working on are the details. Um, it has really been a process. Today we um, are just about at the finish line where we're going to present this document to the Federal Highway Administration for its review. And we really realize, I guess that's coming at the end of this, this particular phase of this process, just what we have been able to accomplish. We brought people to a table who clearly did not see eye to eye, but have come to a place where we understand that we can all reach the same end. And that end is ensuring that people who live in the city of Syracuse, who are impacted by that highway, are provided opportunities. It also will um, engage multiple training, existing and um, 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 being developed training opportunities um, like uh, Pathways to Apprenticeship, the DOT's existing training, as well as our partners with EOC, CNY Works, um, and many community organizations to ensure that we're creating a pipeline of trained and skilled workforce to have an opportunity on the project. I'm very proud of the work that we've done over the course of several months, and I think that um, what we are accomplishing here, again, will be used as a model as we're looking at these infrastructure and highway projects going forward. As the Biden administration has talked about, workforce development has to be uh, parallel in that conversation. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. All right, just a few more updates. Uh, road reconstruction. You don't have to go far to see that we are doing a lot of road reconstruction in the city of Syracuse. And uh, what I keep reminding myself and others is short-term pain for, for long-term gain. So just a quick update. Um, we are really making unprecedented progress on road reconstruction. And uh, we're doing it because we are investing federal funds, state funds, and local funds. Um, we had mentioned a, a few weeks back that in addition to the regular state funds that are provided, uh, thanks to the support of our local state delegation, uh, led by uh, Transportation Chair Assemblyman Bill Magnarelli, we received an additional $7 million for our roads this year, and we are putting it uh, to good use. Our DPW uh, street repair crew is uh, is just firing on all cylinders, and we're excited. So downtown, uh, that's a, the, the projects happening downtown are part of a federally funded projects, um, and uh, specific updates, so we are uh, moving north on State and Salina as part of that uh, that federally funded project, moving up to where uh, Salina and State converge just north of downtown. Um, and uh, we're also working on improving corners uh, for ADA compliance. Uh, Clinton and Warren, you may notice, uh, have uh, what we call our binder course down. So uh, we still need to put a top course on there, and we're going to be doing that uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, the crews are also finishing utilities work and full depth reconstruction on Montgomery and Jefferson, right, including right outside of City Hall. And once that work is done, and that includes work from our city water department, uh, we will come through and, and repave all of that as well. Um, beyond the federally funded projects, we've talked a lot about the total number of, of miles 
uh, that we are milling and paving in the city. Again, for some historical perspective, in 2017, the city did about four miles. Last year, we did about 15 miles uh, of mill and pave through the city. And uh, just maybe a month or two ago, uh, we had predicted that we were going to do about 24 miles of milling and paving this year. Um, we think that that number is actually going to be higher than that. Um, and that doesn't include the 30 miles uh, of slurry seal that we do on the unimproved roads. Uh, so really significant progress. Again, we understand it presents some short-term inconveniences, but uh, our, our city is going to be better off for it. And I just want to give a shout out to our DPW team and everybody else that's making that work possible. So um, I mentioned this Friday, big game coming up, SU Clemson. Um, really proud of our, how hard our football team's been, been playing this year. Uh, just painfully close games that we've been on the wrong side of. But, um, but I feel like we're, uh, we're getting close to a breakthrough. So what better time than uh, this Friday with Clemson in the house? Uh, as exciting as it is, as fun as it is, uh, it does present us with some challenges, and I just want to uh, touch on that briefly. The Dome in Syracuse University is in a neighborhood, in multiple neighborhoods, actually. And so when people are going to the games, they have to be cognizant of the fact that they are uh, in people's neighborhoods. And one of the ways in which uh, all too often they are not cognizant of that uh, is as it relates to parking, uh, illegal parking. Um, so not only is it a quality of life issue for those that live in the neighborhoods, uh, illegal parking is also a public safety issue and one that we're taking very seriously. So we've been stepping up enforcement on game days, uh, parking enforcement, uh, whether it be in the surrounding neighborhoods and Thornton Park. Uh, we're going to be doing that again this year, uh, I'm sorry, this weekend. And just for some perspective, during the first four games, uh, the Syracuse Police Department has issued nearly 600 tickets for illegally parked cars uh, in the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, we take no satisfaction in that, uh, but it's a it's a uh, an indication of how seriously we take this issue and how seriously we want our fans to take this issue. Uh, there are plenty of, of parking options. Uh, we encourage people to, to use them. Uh, and uh, again, if you don't, we're going to be out there and uh, and we're going to be issuing more tickets. Other than that, I would just say go use. Last but not least, on a on a fun ending note, um, the Anadarko Gettys uh, play lot which is at the corner, appropriately, of uh, West Onondaga and Geddes Street, uh, is a, uh, it's, it's uh, been a long time since that uh, play lot has seen TLC. I'm pretty sure that the equipment that we just demolished there a few weeks ago was the equipment that I played on when I was a kid. Um, so right now, if you go up there, you will no longer see the playground, but you'll see a lot of lumber, a lot of trees. And that's because our, our skilled trades and our parks team and our forestry group are working together uh, to create a new natural play space using uh, trees removed from sites around the city. So we're reusing, uh, reusing the logs from, uh, from our own forestry efforts uh, and uh, we're going to be setting them up in really fun ways to provide opportunities for climbing and balancing and uh, really just to give our neighborhood kids a, a fun new creative space to, to play in safely. So um, you'll be seeing much more work over there in the coming weeks. I know we covered a lot. Happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Can you talk a little bit more about your uh, visit at Van Dyne? And this is certainly, as you pointed out, not the first time Van Dyne has yeah. been in a negative, you know, connotation or conversation in the community. Uh, is it worse now? And what are, what are people dealing with that are living there? Yeah, you know, it, it, it of course was hard to tell just from being there. Um, you know, we were we were escorted through the facility uh, with with ownership uh, and management. Um, you know, they have put a good amount of money into the facility. You can see the, the upgrades that they made in their common areas and in some of their rooms. Um, so that was cer certainly uh, good to see. Um, but it was hard to get a good sense of, of, of what the living conditions were for those that were there. We did walk into a rehab room and saw some people uh, doing some, um, some physical therapy. Uh, so again, Mary, it's hard to tell uh, just from that visit, uh, but the purpose of that visit again, was to reiterate uh, our grave concerns about the conditions that people, look, people are living in up there, to hear uh, from management and the ownership and, and uh, that they are as concerned about those conditions as, as we are. Um, I did hear that, um, but I think that uh, we need to see it. We need to see it in the form of uh, inspection reports from State Department of Health. Uh, we need to see it from 
residents and loved ones. Uh, but up to this point, we've heard many more complaints and concerns than we have good news. So uh, I continue to be very, very concerned. So those complaints from people who have family members in fire, what, what drew you there with the, the two senators today? Absolutely, yeah. We've, you know, we have, uh, my office has heard directly from concerned family members. We've certainly seen that the media reports that many of you have done uh, to shed light on the issue. Uh, and uh, again, it's a significant concern. Now, I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm sympathetic to, their, to, to some of their challenges, uh, namely staffing. We know that the entire healthcare industry, not to mention most other, other industries, are, are really challenged with staffing. Uh, but we're all facing those same challenges, and, and, and none of that can be an excuse for allowing people to live in squalor, uh, to not be uh, properly attended to, and, um, and that's, those are the reports that, that, we're, that we're getting. So again, I, I heard all the right things from the ownership and management. I talked to some of the direct um, care providers and they care. And they care deeply about those that they're serving and it, and it, and it pains them uh, to, to, see the, to see the reports um, that, that have come out and to see some of the, uh, some of the challenges that their residents have. Um, one thing that I do want to make clear, um, while we are certainly concerned uh, that shouldn't take away from the heroic efforts um, that the, the nurses and healthcare providers have put forth uh, over the course of the pandemic. There are people in that building that care deeply about those that they're serving uh, and are pained just as much as we are about those conditions. And, and uh, again, I don't want that to be lost uh, in all of this. So th this, is a, this is a responsibility of ownership and management, um, and, uh, and, and that's where we're going to focus our attention. Are the issues on infection control or quality of life or both? All, all of the above. Yeah, all of the above. Um, you know, the infection control is is a challenge, and you know they did uh, they did acknowledge the challenge of the of the, the continued changes to guidance that they received from the state. Um, but uh, that that's an issue, as is again just overall um, uh, conditions of uh, you know, of, of, the, of the rooms and, uh, and facilities. But again, what I what I saw looked good, but uh, we need to make sure that, um, that that's what that's what we see from the reports and from the residents themselves and their family members. And how many city workers have been vaccinated? So I know you said that fifty six percent of employees have provided proof of vaccination. Yeah. How many? City workers have been vaccinated. So I don't have the specific number here. We can get that to you. Uh, and again, I want to be clear that th these are the, the number that the 56% represents <clears throat> those that have provided proof of vaccination. And I, I just want to be crystal clear because I, I, I'm hoping I don't see any headlines about 56% of city employees vaccinated. The, the reality is we, we know that, that is not, uh, that's not the number because we have people that have not yet reported. That's what those are. That's the, the percentage of people. And again, we can get you the specific number of people that uh, that have provided proof of vaccination. Uh, what we're and what we're challenged with right now, and where we're really uh, pu pushing our department heads and supervisors, is to determine of those that have not re yet reported. Uh, why is that? Are they are they having continued challenges, whether it's technology or otherwise, or are they uh, or are they intentionally not complying with the policy? And if that's the case, that's a big problem. And we've been very clear, um, both with our employees and with our labor representatives, that there will be progressive discipline that comes from that. But given the, the, the work that it's taken to stand up the program, to, to uh, procure and stand up uh, two different databases that we then need to, to get to talk to each other. It's been, you know, again, we're, we don't have a, a, a guidebook here. So it's taken us you know, more than a month now to get all of that to a, a place where we can get a clear snapshot. And it's going to take us probably another week or two until we have that. Uh, so that 56%, uh, again, it, are those that have provided proof of vaccination. We believe that number is higher, but I can't tell you where. Yeah. The, the city employee numbers, does that include STD? <clears throat> it does, yeah. yeah. And again, um, I know there's been a lot of focus on, on the police department, but the, the 56% is pretty uh, pretty representative of all the departments. There's no department based on what we're seeing so far that is standing uh, standing out. Um, uh, it, again, especially with you know the the, the lower numbers uh, tend to be uh, on the larger departments um, in terms of overall reporting, and I think that's just a, the nature of uh, of the, the size of, of the departments, the number of employees. The, the varying um, 
conditions in which they're uh, they're working different hours, some using technology, some not. It's just uh, logistically, it's been it's been challenging, but you know, I, I, I'm confident we're gonna we're gonna get there. Um, and uh, once we get there, I think we'll have a uh, we'll have the ability to um, not only help other municipalities or communities that are looking at doing something similar, um, but also to be able to help our employees to make sure that they're that, that they're healthy and safe and, and ideally continue to get that vaccination rate up. You mentioned last week on that point that you would talk to the president of the union for SPD and there was an agreement that there would be encouragement to follow the policy, however that works, whether it's vaccinations or the testing policy. Yeah. How is that going? Yeah, you know, that, that was the last conversation I had with uh, with, with PBA President Moran, uh, but he did again uh, commit to me that he was he was going to encourage his membership to participate. Uh, I, I expect that's what he's done. Um, I'll probably circle back with him sometime soon just to check in to see how it's going. Uh, but yeah, overall, you know, uh, labor representatives have done their jobs and and, and at times have challenged us, uh, but overall they've um, you know, we've, they've maintained open lines of communication. They've been responsive and. and we're making progress. What is the progressive discipline outlining for the employees that you say could be falling in the category of just neglecting to put their information into the database? Yeah, so um, it, it starts with um, a written reprimand and can end with termination. And, and there's a progression that gets there. Uh, I can't speak to the to the specific steps, but uh, uh, termination is, is the uh, is the end of that process and again I really hope we don't get to that um, we're asking people that aren't vaccinated to be tested and this is a test that is a saliva a pooled saliva sample I did it last week it couldn't be easier it couldn't be less invasive uh, and by getting tested we're protecting our employees health we're protecting their colleagues health and we're protecting their families health no one should have an issue with it and if they do we're gonna have an issue with them shots powder expansion that's a program that had to be cut or scaled back. Um, why the expansion? Did that identify the, the value of that program? And um, it seems like with adding that area that it covers, you're almost doubling the coverage area of this technology, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a shot, Chief, and if you want to fill in any blanks. Um, you know, the, the, um, the, the temporary stoppage of shot spotter was not something that we wanted to do. It's something that we had to do given the dire financial conditions that we were facing at the time. Um, we made a lot of difficult decisions and that's what you have to do in times of crisis. Uh, at, at the time when we looked at all of the uh, all of the ways in which um, we fund the police department, you know, we look at ShotSpotter as, as a very useful tool, um, but when you line it up against staffing, uh, street surveillance cameras, uh, and, and other investments that we make in SPD, ultimately, that, that was the area that we landed on that needed to be scaled back, in addition to other areas, uh, including including overtime. But it didn't mean that we didn't see value in it. We clearly do. And uh, as, as Chief alluded to, you know, we have had uh, issues with uh, gun crime and violent crime throughout the city, but you know, increasingly on the north side. And so ShotSpotter is a tool that helps us uh, to more quickly identify where those shots are coming from, get officers on the scene faster, ideally, um, be on the scene when the perpetrators are on the scene or the victims, um, but if not that, I'll be able to recover evidence. Um, so it's another tool in the toolkit, and it's one that now that we have uh, some resources, we wanted to make sure we were investing in and in, in expanding uh, to, again, um, uh, provide improvements to, uh, to that part of the city. Anything else? Should that take place now, or is that to be added? Sure. We'll be adding it. Okay. Chief, can you just talk about that? Those are some young ages that you that you touched on with the with the gun crimes. Um, can you just talk about what that? I mean, how, how you're taking that in? I mean, two 16 year olds and an 18 year old arrested in one incident, and then a 22 and 23 year old. If I have that right, what's going on there? And that that's concerning. It's got to be concerning to you. Well, it's a it's a continued pattern of. of Victim suspects that we see in our city uh, is consistent with what we see in the urban city of America. Uh, Syracuse is not an exception to that. Uh, you, there are many different socioeconomical things that occur that, that happen in the, these young people's lives. Uh, there also has to be some accountability on their decision making uh, and, and their behavior. Uh, but it's just a, a part of a frustrating pattern that we've seen uh, the where we're having both young victims and suspects uh, in these violent crimes uh, and more often than not um, 
they involve people of color. Did anybody get hurt in any of those situations or anything? Not in the, the, the arrest that we made, no. And all those people were arrested, the, the two from the, the Midland Avenue and the three for the, from, from the uh, industry? Yes. 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 But but you have to you know, understand that most of those, if not, I know, maybe with the exception of one of those, are probably out given our system yeah. the way we handle those kind of things. Any other questions? May I just have one more? Sorry. Sure. Uh, back to the fifty-six percent. Yeah. Uh, so, is anyone who's not within that fifty-six percent already out of compliance, or will they become out of compliance at some? So technically, they're they're out of compliance, but again, we 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 try to allow for some flexibility for those various challenges uh, in terms of just uh, you know again working with that technology. So you know, we we provided some flexibility there. Um, we haven't issued any discipline yet, but uh, you know our expectation is by um, by the end of the month uh, there won't be any need for any additional flexibility, and, and we'll be ready to start the discipline process if necessary. Sorry, I forgot to cut my mask off. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.